indexes are typically constructed through a variety of rules and principles that will determine how an index will function and perform. Each index provider has its own rules for determining the starting universe, how index constituents are selected from that universe, and how they should be weighed in the index. They will also have rules for the calculation of the performance of those indexes. Choosing an investment universe starts with the decision of what type of securities will be included. An index can include equities, fixed income, real estate, commodities, currencies, or even other alternative investments, such as private equity and hedge funds. Then, within that type of security or investment, the index provider may want to focus on a subset. For example, within fixed income, it might target government bonds or corporate bonds. This means an index provider will set clear rules on what is eligible for inclusion in the index while being mindful that markets and inclusion criteria may need to evolve. An index provider chooses the securities that are in an index by including as many securities as possible within that market or market segment while being mindful that the index may be used in the creation of a financial product. This means that you will need to consider certain investability criteria in order to assess how easily an investor will be able to purchase and sell the securities in the index. These criteria will often refer to things like which securities are available for public trading, how frequently they are traded, and how easily they can be accessed. These principles can be applied across different types of securities, but unique traits of each will typically account for some differences. In equities, which are publicly traded instruments, most of these investability measures are based on readily accessible data and are more straightforward to calculate. Fixed income securities, on the other hand, do not trade on open exchanges, meaning that their prices are potentially less visible and that the securities themselves may not be readily available for purchase. providers may use classification frameworks to help group securities and gain efficiencies in scale in index construction. For example, they may create a country classification framework to assign securities to a market, which can be used to help create market, regional or global indexes. Index providers may also implement market classification frameworks to reflect how institutional investors think about the economic development and market accessibility of each country. Another type of classification commonly used is an industry classification, which will reflect the primary business activity for a given company and help the index provider create industry-specific indexes. These frameworks and standards may be designed to avoid overlaps, such as companies being classified in more than one category and gaps where the standard is incomplete and falls short of covering the desired exposure or market segment. The most common way to weigh securities in an index is to look at the size of each index constituent. Equities are measured by market capitalization of that company, while in fixed income this can mean considering the debt outstanding for that specific issue. When we talk about market capitalization, we are referring to the size of a company in the stock market, as it is calculated by multiplying the number of shares by the share price. In fact, market capitalizations can be used to create additional classification frameworks to help investors better understand the company's performance and risk. Index providers such as MSCI will use it to classify companies by size, large, mid and small cap companies. In fixed income, index providers may also consider the coupon that is payable when determining the size of a fixed income index constituent. Yes, they do. Indexes change as companies and markets change. Companies may go out of business, they may merge with other companies, and new companies may be listed. And in the case of fixed income, some bonds may reach maturity, while new ones are issued. This is why index providers impose regular and systematic reviews on their indexes, which may lead to changes in the composition of those indexes. Regularly scheduled reviews need to be frequent enough to prevent an index from retaining stale data but not too frequent as to potentially impose additional trading to investors. In equities, indexes may be rebalanced two to four times a year, 
newborn indexes, on the other hand, are generally rebalanced more frequently, in most cases monthly, as the universes of available bonds changes a lot more often than equities. In addition to an index construction methodology, index providers may set out an index calculation methodology. That methodology can define how the aggregate value is calculated at any point. This is usually called the index value, and it incorporates the total market capitalization of all the securities included in the index. The performance of an index will be the result of how that value changes over time. Given that an index's value depends on the constituent's market capitalization, how stock prices change will impact that index's value. But there is more to stock ownership than participating on potential price appreciation, as companies pay dividends and shareholders may be entitled to a share of those dividends. Given this, equity indexes may be designed to account for those returns, which should lead to the calculation of total return indexes. And as most of us live in a world where taxes are due on any gains, index providers may also calculate net return indexes, which would incorporate taxes to allow for a closer representation of what an institutional investor would experience in terms of returns after taxes. It is similar in fixed income, as you can have price returns and total returns. Bonds don't pay dividends, but they may pay coupons to investors, which would need to be accounted for in the index return calculation.